Oxygen Metabolism by Dr. Brian McAlvin. Hi, my name is Dr. Brian McAlvin. I'm a pediatric intensive care physician at Children's Hospital Boston. And today we're gonna to discuss a framework by which to approach complex physiology in the intensive care unit. The majority of patients that we see in the intensive care unit can be simplified to oxygen delivery versus oxygen consumption. First, let's start with a graph. The majority of what we do in the pediatric intensive care unit revolves around this graph, where on the x-axis we have delivery of oxygen denoted by DO2, and on the y-axis we have consumption of oxygen denoted by VO2. Now in the case of the brain, VO2 has a special title called CMRO2, Cerebral Metabolic Rate for Oxygen Consumption. And the graph looks like this. And what you'll notice is that for a broad range of oxygen delivery from high to low, that the consumption of oxygen, whether the brain or the tissue systemically, remains relatively constant until delivery reaches a point where it's inadequate for the consumptive needs of the tissues and the oxygen consumption goes down in a linear fashion with delivery. That's called the supply-dependent portion of the curve, and the point at which that happens is called the critical DO2. The importance of this is that studies have shown the longer you remain on the supply-dependent portion of the curve, the longer your ICU stay, the longer the ventilator days, and the higher the mortality. It's important to note here that identifying patients on the supply-dependent portion of the curve can be difficult, and clinical exam alone is going to be inadequate to identify who's here and who needs to have their delivery of oxygen augmented to move them to the supply-independent portion of the curve. And so today's discussion will be about, number one, how we identify those patients, and number two, the therapies that we can institute to move them from supply dependency to being supply independent and thereby improve their outcome in the pediatric intensive care unit. So first, let's start with something called the oxygen cascade. We're gonna follow the oxygen molecule from the atmosphere all the way to the mitochondria. After all, delivery of oxygen, your job is to get it from the atmosphere to the mitochondria so that the mitochondria can utilize nutrient substrates uh, to do cellular function. So first, atmospheric oxygen. The partial pressure of atmospheric oxygen, your PiO2, is equal to your FiO2 multiplied by the barometric pressure. Barometric pressure is typically 760 millimeters of mercury. And your FiO2, under normal conditions, is 21% giving you a value of 159 millimeters of mercury. So automatically, the air that enters into your large airways has a partial pressure of oxygen of 159. Upon entry into your airways, though, there are other gases that occupy partial pressure. And as you recall from undergraduate chemistry, Dalton's law states that the sum of all the partial pressures of each individual gas represents the total pressure of the gas mixture. So what gases are we concerned about in the airway? There's vapor pressure and there's carbon dioxide, both of which exert a partial pressure. And before we can determine what the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is, we first need to account for carbon dioxide and water in the airway. And so, this gives rise to the alveolar gas equation, represented by P big A O2. And the formula is as follows. It's your FiO2 multiplied by atmospheric pressure, 760, now subtracting out the partial pressure of water, which under usual circumstances is 47 millimeters of mercury. This accounts for vapor pressure but we also have to subtract the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is represented by this portion of the equation, 
So this is the carbon dioxide that you measure in arterial gas. And the respiratory quotient is something that we'll return to when we talk about tissue consumption of oxygen. So more to follow on that. But what the alveolar gas equation simplifies to is your FiO2 multiplied by 713, where you subtract out the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And the typical respiratory quotient for most people under normal circumstances is approximately 0.8. And from there, your usual value, the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 millimeters of mercury. And so you'll notice that the first step in the oxygen cascade where we lose partial pressure of oxygen is because of the gases that occupy the alveolus. The next step is the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary bed at the alveolus, and that's roughly equal to your PaO2, your P big A O2. And so you don't have a decline in the oxygen partial pressure. The next point in the oxygen cascade where we can measure the partial pressure of oxygen is the arterial partial pressure of oxygen after it leaves the left ventricle, denoted by P little a O2, which is approximately 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Now that we've determined the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial systemic circulation, you immediately recognize that there are other parameters that we're used to using clinically to help us guide the amount of oxygen that's in the blood. Importantly, that would be SAO2, normal values of which are 93 to 100%. And that's your SAT by pulse oximetry. So on a side note, let's discuss the content of oxygen in the arterial blood, because you'll notice there's two types of oxygen in the blood. There's oxygen that's dissolved in its soluble form, represented by your P little a O2, and then there's oxygen that's bound to hemoglobin, represented by your SaO2, which is the percent of oxyhemoglobin in the blood. And so, the arterial content of oxygen is best described by the equation. And immediately what you recognize is that this equation has two factors, the amount of oxygen bound to hemoglobin and the amount of oxygen dissolved in the blood. And you can see that the dissolved portion is trivial. And the amount bound to hemoglobin really determines the vast majority of oxygen content in your arterial blood. Value for arterial oxygen content can also represent venous content of oxygen here. The oxygen content of blood after it's passed through the circulation. The formula is the same, but what you change is you have a mixed venous saturation and partial pressure of venous oxygen. Similarly, the same thing can be said for the content of jugular venous bulb oxygen. Same values, different units, depending on where the blood is sampled. The difference between venous content of oxygen, the oxygen content of blood after it's passed through the circulation, and the content of jugular venous bulb oxygen, the oxygen content of blood after it's passed through the central nervous system is something that we'll return to when we talk about tissue consumption of oxygen. So more to follow on that. And finally, the content of oxygen in the pulmonary capillary. So you noticed that after talking about content of oxygen in the blood, that there's a step down from your pulmonary capillary oxygen content to here, the partial pressure goes from 100 to 80 to 100. What accounts for that difference? It turns out that in everybody, there's physiologic shunting, VQ mismatch, bronchial veins, Thebesian veins in the myocardium. All of it creates a physiologic right to left shunt where deoxygenated blood bypasses the alveolus and enters into the systemic circulation. And that's called venous 
admixture. And that's represented by QS, the amount of flow that goes through the shunt, versus QT, the total flow that goes through the pulmonary circulation. And we can create an equation that describes the shunt fraction. QS over QT. The greater the shunt fraction, the greater the step down between the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. That formula is represented by the content of pulmonary capillary oxygen minus the arterial content of oxygen, the mixed blood, divided by the total, which is pulmonary capillary oxygen content minus your mixed venous oxygen content. And you can see that the larger your shunt fraction, the greater your difference. And this clinically, the difference between your alveolar partial pressure of oxygen and your arterial is known as the AA gradient. And an AA gradient, you can see, within physiologic values, is anywhere less than 20. And a wide AA gradient simply tells you that your shunt fraction is increased. And so, you can see we measure content of oxygen in various places by the same equation with different parameters. The jugular venous bulb, your mixed venous oxygen content, your pulmonary capillary content of oxygen, and here, your arterial content of oxygen. Which brings us to the next equation to be introduced, delivery of oxygen, which is equal to cardiac output multiplied by the arterial content of oxygen. You'll recall delivery of oxygen, DO2, from this graph. And what you can see is that parameters that influence the delivery of oxygen are both your cardiac output and the content of oxygen in the blood. Similarly, it can be stated that delivery of oxygen to the brain equals cerebral blood flow multiplied by CaO2. And this is approximately 20% of your cardiac output that goes to the brain. What I hope you take away from this is that these are unifying simple themes that help you understand delivery of oxygen to various parts of the body. In this case, in the special case of the brain, it's cerebral blood flow, whereas for global systemic circulation, it's your entire cardiac output. Nonetheless, the principles are the same. It's how much oxygen you can load into the blood multiplied by how you get it there, your cardiac output or your cerebral blood flow. In animal models, it's been shown that under normal conditions, oxygen delivery typically remains at least five times greater than oxygen consumption. When oxygen delivery is inadequate to supply enough oxygen to meet oxygen consumption, anaerobic metabolism and lactic acidosis result. This physiologic condition occurs when the systemic oxygen delivery is less than two times oxygen consumption. It's been suggested that in order to avoid oxygen supply dependency and maintain moderate oxygen delivery reserve, a good rule of thumb is to keep oxygen delivery at least three times greater than oxygen consumption. Although one may not routinely measure cardiac output or oxygen consumption in the PICU, DO2-VO2 ratio can be measured or estimated. Even if you don't measure or estimate the DO2-VO2 ratio, the take-home message is that mixed venous oxygen saturation and lactate should be measured frequently during the care of critically ill patients. These measures can be used to estimate oxygen delivery and consumption. So once the blood makes its way to its destination, the tissues, that brings up another set of considerations. Let's start by the formula VO2 is equal to your cardiac output multiplied by your CaO2 minus your CVO2. What that states is that the consumption of oxygen 
is equal to your cardiac output multiplied by the difference between the content on the arterial side and the content of oxygen on the venous side. And this is a major theme I want you to take away from this. It's the upstream oxygen content minus the downstream oxygen content after it's passed through the tissues that defines something called your AVO2 difference, your arterial venous oxygen difference. So now that we've discussed consumption of oxygen represented by this equation, it's really this simple that the same principle applies to the brain. Except now, what we care about is a small subset of the cardiac output, the cerebral blood flow. And so what we can say is that CMRO2 equals cerebral blood flow multiplied by your arterial content of oxygen here minus the downstream content of oxygen here, which is the content of jugular venous oxygen. Written another way, it equals cerebral blood flow multiplied by 1.34 multiplied by your hemoglobin times your arterial oxygen saturation minus jugular venous bulb saturation. Similarly, VO2 can be written cardiac output multiplied by 1.34 multiplied by your hemoglobin multiplied by your arterial oxygen saturation minus mixed venous saturation. And so you can see that although different terms, they really are the same thing, but they're dependent upon the fact that this is a smaller subset of cardiac output and this represents your global systemic cardiac output and consumption of oxygen. So now that we've talked about consumption of oxygen, there's something called the oxygen extraction fraction, your OEF, and that's the amount of oxygen extracted from the blood as it passes through the tissues. And your oxygen extraction fraction is equal to what you consume divided by what's delivered, which is equal to, stated another way, your cardiac output multiplied by 1.34 times your hemoglobin times your SAO2. Similarly, you can say that your oxygen extraction fraction for the brain is equal to CMRO2 divided by cerebral blood flow multiplied by 1.34 times your hemoglobin times your SAO2. Again, I want to emphasize it's the same overriding principles. One is with respect to the brain and cerebral blood flow, and the other is your global systemic circulation. From there, there's an additional part of this graph I'd like to point out, and that is we can superimpose the oxygen extraction fraction curve to the delivery versus consumption curve. And what you can see from this curve is that as the delivery of oxygen goes down and you're on the supply dependent portion of the curve, the amount of oxygen that you extract goes up linearly. And so what this equation tells you is that if, for example, your cardiac output is impaired, your left ventricle isn't functioning properly, your tissues are gonna compensate by consuming more oxygen, increasing your oxygen extraction fraction represented by this part of the curve. So recall, if you will, from the beginning of the lecture where I said our job is to get oxygen from the atmosphere to the mitochondria. It turns out mitochondria reside in the tissues and in the brain. And as you recall from college biochemistry, in the cell you have a glucose molecule. It's converted to fructose, then fructose 6-phosphate, and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And then it's broken into three carbon molecules, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, glyceraldehyde phosphate, and it goes through the glycolytic pathway to pyruvate, where it then enters into the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, and that occurs in the mitochondria. Well, what's the point of that? As these energy molecules, glucose, enters into the Krebs cycle, it generates carbon dioxide and it generates water. 
But more importantly, it generates ATP, which is a high energy molecule. In addition, it generates something called NADH. And NADH is an electron rich and proton rich molecule that transports it to the inner mitochondrial membrane, where then it enters in to the electron transport chain through the various cytochrome pathways with the ultimate terminal electron acceptor being oxygen, which is the entire point of this lecture, is to get oxygen from the atmosphere to the mitochondria where you can generate this electron and proton gradient with oxygen being the terminal electron acceptor. As that happens, protons are being transported into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria creating a gradient, and as those protons pass through the ATPase, it turns ADP into ATP, your high energy molecule. And this is the crux of our job in the intensive care unit, is to support this metabolic pathway, allowing energy molecules like glucose to be converted to high energy molecules like ATP, using oxygen as the term terminal electron acceptor. And if we fail to do so, we're here on the supply dependent part of the curve. So how do you know, as we come back to our discussion, that you're on the supply dependent part of the curve? Well, if you can't, if the Krebs cycle isn't generating your ATP molecules, you have to use anaerobic metabolism, which generates lactate. And so hyperlactatemia is a global representation of anaerobic metabolism and inadequate oxygen delivery. But similarly, in addition to a high lactate, we can look at this AVO2 difference. The difference in the arterial content versus venous content. And if the difference is high, in other words, if the difference between the arterial content here and the venous content here, the mixed venous content, is great, that tells you that delivery of oxygen to the tissue is impaired and that you're extracting as much oxygen out of the blood as possible in route to your mixed venous circulation. Alternatively, you could be hypermetabolic. You could be febrile. You could be having seizures, in which case your jugular venous content of oxygen would drop. And so now your job is to identify patients here on the curve by the presence of lactate and a large AVO2 difference. And the way we often do this is by measurement of something called a mixed venous saturation. And as you recall, as we went through the formulas for content of oxygen at various points in the circulation, if you were to sample the oxygen saturation here in the pulmonary artery, you'd have a mixed venous sat. Another way to express oxygen extraction fraction is your arterial sat minus your mixed venous sat divided by your arterial sat. And if your oxygen extraction fraction is excessively high, greater than 30%, that tells you that you're either consuming a lot of oxygen in the tissues or not delivering enough with an impaired cardiac output. And again, up here, that's equal to the same equation as here, except using the jugular venous sat. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that in clinical practice, we don't measure the oxygen content in the jugular venous bulb. Instead, we use a surrogate that contains a lot of caveats. And that surrogate is near-infrared spectroscopy, your NEARS monitor. So here, we'll put NEARS in parentheses. If you're concerned about delivery versus consumption to the brain, then NEARS is typically what we would use. So now that we've identified how to compare upstream to downstream, similarly upstream to downstream, let's say clinically we've identified a large AVO2 difference. How do we use that information? So number one, we have to ask the question, why is this AVO2 difference large? Well, in the case of the systemic circulation, it could be a couple of things. Number one, it could be that your cardiac output is inadequate. Alternatively, it could be that your consumption of oxygen is high. And so we identify that we're on the supply-dependent portion of the curve, evidenced by an elevated lactate 
and a mixed venous saturation that's low, what are we going to do to fix it? And we can take this approach in one of two pathways. We can treat DO2 to improve it, or we can reduce VO2. To augment delivery of oxygen, DO2 is equal to cardiac output times CaO2. And from that equation, we know that delivery of oxygen can be augmented by fluids, vasoactive infusions, oxygen, and not just by nasal cannula, but including mechanical ventilation. A very important one is that we can give transfusions. And from this, you can see that by transfusing, we're increasing your CaO2, and this is the single most significant factor that determines content of oxygen in the blood. So that's how we augment delivery of oxygen. Alternatively, we can regulate consumption of oxygen by controlling fever. We can sedate. We can paralyze. All of these in an effort to match delivery to consumption. Similarly, for the brain, let's say we identify an AVO2 difference evidenced by your NIRS reading with a downward trend. You would have to ask, is it because cerebral blood flow is inadequate? In other words, hyperventilation, hypotension, hypovolemia, anemia, elevated jugular venous pressure, high mean airway pressure from the ventilator, seizures. And from this you can see that using delivery versus consumption gives you very powerful clinical diagnostic tools for inadequate oxygen delivery, excessive consumption, or a mismatch of delivery to consumption. And it allows you to institute the proper therapy based on the reason for the delivery versus consumption mismatch. Same holds true for the central nervous system. So my hope today is that what you take away from this lecture is that through a series of physiologic principles and mathematic equations, you can identify physiologic derangements and institute the proper therapy in a sound, reasoned approach using basic physiologic principles. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.